Uh, good morning, good night, good evening, Shakti Namaste. Here's my practice vid for my spiritual update. Uh, it's coming out soon. I think I'm going to just uh, start putting out spiritual updates. Maybe once a week. Because I did my TV show. Uh, my name is Kurt Kerber. Uh, I'm a healer who also happens to be a shaman and uh, who also happens to be a healer, who also happens to be a uh, therapeutic hypnotist for regression, past life regression, PTSD uh, therapy, as well as I'm probably one of the few people that is certified to treat PTSD in people that are transitioning. Uh, yeah, I got all that going on over here. Yep. And uh, I'm sober almost 40 years. Shocked in a must day. So uh, I had a TV show in a legitimate, like, million dollar studio pre COVID, and the studio has shut down. For the last two years. So uh, I really miss making my TV show. Uh, it went out live stream. I don't know. Uh, potential audience unlimited. Uh, but uh, they told me half a million in New York City roughly. But uh, every week. So that's the tip. That's the thing. Get ready for my psychic spiritual updates. Shakti. Namaste. You're being healed right now. You know, I'm not really like a button down type of guy. I'm trying to get used to wearing clothes again. I, I was in pajamas like for a year and a half when we were under severe lockdown and none of my clothes fit anymore. I'm not really a button down person, but I am a gay guy and I can't resist like the perfect color. <laughs> I can't resist the perfect color of a shirt. And this is like this perfect blue-gray, which I was Mr. Gray before the grays. I really was. Uh, I wanted all gray, gray or black, white, black, or gray. If you Google uh, the gray code for the Jedi, you'll... Uh, I don't know. You'll see uh, that uh, it's the in-between thing that you have to make peace with. So you have like complete white, complete black, and then in the middle they blur, and that's kind of where I exist. In the fifth dimension, uh, I'm getting ready to make... Uh, a video about the history of shamanism and mediumship. So mediumship starts in Mesopotamia and then Egypt. And since basically the beginning of time, uh, oh, I forgot to say I'm a psychic. Did I? Trans medium channeler, healer. So uh, I read past lives. I want to pass. Okay, first of all, I have the perfect shaman Einstein hair. But, so, you know, psychic mediums always have, like, weird hair. It's just a thing, bro. It, you're going to have to get used to it. Look at Teresa Caputo. You know what I mean? That over-the-top fucking beehive she wears. Every medium usually has some weird thing about their hair. Most mediums dye their hair black jet black so for being 60 years old uh, I got the hair shaman hair so actually when you put your hair straight up it is the indication of magic that's true so wear your hair all the way up so you can tell everybody that you're magic that's why I call it the shaman hair uh, the presence of stick straight up hair is magic uh, it's a magic person so um, 
What else did I want to talk about? The history of mediumship goes all the way back to the royal king and queen of Egypt. <clears throat> Every king and queen always had a psychic advisor, spiritual advisor, or a card reader. The tarot cards actually go back to uh, the 13th century or so. Um, what else did I want to say? I think that's about it. Uh, oh, Haunted Planet. So, the planet's haunted. And, you know, being an addict and alcoholic in recovery, close to 40 years in like on five different issues. It's the master class in, you know, transcending the darkness and ascending up out of the darkness. Spirituality is, it's not rainbows and unicorns. It's an ass kicker that takes unbelievable persistence, consistency, and diligence and vigilance. Uh, I've been meditating over 20 years, so when I say I'm in the zone, let me tell you, I am in the zone. And so you have to be in the zone to like be a good reader. So it's easier to stay in the zone than it is to get in the zone. Uh, so no matter what happens, it's back to the breath. Shut. Uh, you want the master class in being a master of the universe? It's a couple of things. Back to the breath. No matter what, don't react. You know, do not react. No matter what, shut, just back to the breath. Stay in your body. Don't get out of your body. Uh, the tranquil mind is the mind of the master. The best fighter is never angry. That's Bruce Lee. Let's see, seven minutes. Uh, so, yeah. Um, when I was a kid, uh, we lived about 35 minutes from Disneyland. And uh, <clears throat> one of the first things they opened up was the Haunted Mansion. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I walk in as a healer, as a Buddha becoming, which we all do, but my, uh, all my higher channels were completely opened and evolved. Uh, I had the vocabulary of a college person when I was like seven years old. Uh, so we would go to uh, the Haunted Mansion and I was like, I saw Madame Leota, if you want to Google it, if you don't know, or you've been to the Haunted Mansion. Madame Leota uh, is a head in a crystal ball, and she is summoning the spirits. Uh, all you spirits, wherever they dwell, I summon you now by ringing a bell. I'm paraphrasing. And then this bell would go off, and this, like purple face was inside this crystal ball and so Madame Leota was the medium and I was like oh spirits like it was my favorite ride it was uh, one of the first things that told me I have my clipboards over there with all my notes uh, it was the first thing that told me there's like there's spirits like something's going on here something else is going on uh, my father, uh, owned property, rental properties all throughout East LA. And, uh, he would buy these little tiny plots of land and then he, uh, would bulldoze the buildings that were on the land and then he would build an apartment complex on top of it. And, uh, completely redo most of East LA. Uh, he owned more property uh, than any single person when he passed 20 years ago. He owned more property than any single person. So that's, he would just buy the next property and then bulldoze it. The reason I'm telling you this is because 
Uh, my father grew up in the uh, 30s and 40s. And uh, so, you know, you've got the Great Depression and World War II happening, you know, and this guy, my dad, is like a um, teenager in the midst of all this. He grew up in a, like a field with uh, shacks with no floor. I, I don't even think they had toilets. I mean, that's how poor, like dire, dire poverty. And uh, you can Google it and you can see like they're just uh, these shacks like that are this, you know, they're only like, you know, seven feet by six feet. And they're just made from found wood. Like it's horrifying. So my father started this cement business and uh, he started buying this property because nobody wanted it because it was in the ghetto. And he was like, I'll buy it. So he took me one time to watch some of these houses on a plot of land that he bought that were just shacks. He took me, I was about seven, to watch uh, them bulldoze the entire area that he bought with these little shacks on it. <laughs> A shanty town shack. And as a kid, I remember, uh, I remember looking at these shanty shacks and I could feel uh, the pain as a empath and a psychic and a medium. I could feel like the person's life that was in there. I remember specifically reading like automatically, even before I knew what I was, like I automatically was just like, oh my God. Like it was like watching when these bulldozer came and just pushed these things down with no problem at all. Uh, I remember watching all the like dreams, uh, broken dreams, pain, ghosts, really like just fly up and away from these shacks and I just watched it all like uh and I I feel I think I absorbed some of it to tell you the truth it showed me how much pain there can be in this lifetime and uh I mean the next thing about being a medium was on Easter Sunday uh I'm just waking up. I'm, I'm giving you loving service and I'm just waking up and you're having coffee with me. So I guess this is going to be a thing, this video. So this is in Long Beach, California and in Long Beach, California, let me shut this off. In Long Beach, California, there's a, uh, this freeway that runs perpendicular to a lot of the housing tracks. And there was, it was all empty fields. And so they put grass and turned it into a park. And it was right behind our house. And so for Easter, we decided to go and have a picnic. And, you know, it went on for like a quarter of a mile. And it had like street drive through breaks every so often. So, you know, my parent, my parents, my family was like, you know, I was a kid and I was running around, flapping around. I like to run, you know, kids like to experience their body and just, you know, run around. And uh, so I was running around in my Easter Sunday best and uh, I hear this like loud skidding, like this weird noise. And it comes to a street break and I stop just before it. And this car is probably driving like 75, 80, 90 miles an hour. And it drives head on and wraps itself around a pole right in front of me. And, uh, uh, it was a young kid. I remember a guy in his 20s, he was the only one in the car, and he's in the driver's side, and the car hits this pole, and it just kind of like 
in slow motion. It was the first one of the first times I, I saw time stop. In slow motion, it just like wrapped the car wrapped around the pole and then it just accordion smashed like in slow motion while the guy who was I'm gonna guess high I immediately even as a kid at seven or eight years old I was like this guy's higher than a kite you could just tell and he had like light light green yellow eyes and so the guy is dying and having this is trigger warning so you might want to shut it off uh, the guy is having his legs cut off uh, right in front of me and trying to like at the same time jump uh, out of the car and he he goes like this to me <clears throat> so I was on the passenger side and he's like <sighs> and I just literally watch his spirit leave his body and I'm like holy this place is this place is fucked up y'all I'm you know this is like a I'm seven years old I'm like yep wow so I kind of wonder if that guy's spirit didn't come into my body or attach to me so I saw somebody die very early on and uh saw the like spirit leave like he he just shook a little bit and then it was out and uh i don't know as a medium my uh yeah I, I don't know what i think about that but um uh let me see uh there was a trip that i had to uh berlin and uh I'm sorry, I'm getting these lame text messages on my laptop. Uh, I don't know how to shut it off. Hang on. I'm so sorry. Uh, please bear with me. Because this is, uh, it's embarrassing. Uh, but the people that like my videos, they tolerate me. So, anybody else? Next video right there. Uh, <laughs> they're still coming up. Um... I think, frankly, I should just get a prize for being 60 years old and knowing how to work a Mac. But, uh, okay, I was in this Berlin hotel. And uh, it was really nice, but it was like uh, they had taken an old, like, townhouse and retrofitted it and turned it into, like, a B&B. &B. And uh, so I had a really nice room. And I, I love Berlin. It was awesome. And uh, like around 2 o'clock in the morning, I hear this. And I'm like, somebody's at the door. And there were like these huge French double doors. Uh, there was no glass. It was all wood. And I, I hear it again. Knock, knock, knock. And I'm like, holy fuck. And then... Uh, the, I was like, go the fuck away or something. So the next day I go to the front desk and I'm like, uh, I think there's a ghost in the, in the B&B. Uh, &B. And the guy looks at me and he's like, he, he knew exactly what I was talking about. I was like, this place is haunted. <laughs> and he goes, I mean, of course, the rational explanation is, uh, you know, I don't know. Somebody lost their room key and was just, do, they were drunk and they were trying to get it. But I don't think so. I, I, I felt supernatural activity. So I tell the guy who was the owner, I, the place is haunted. And I said, last night, the ghost knocked on my door and he was like, yes, don't let the ghost in, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. He actually don't open the door. Yikes. Uh, the first psychic reading I ever gave, uh, I was in grade school 
and I was alone. The kids beat me up because I was gay and they smelled it on me and because I was a little witch and they smelled it on me and I was a magic person and I was different. And, you know, in grade school, I mean, kids are mean and cruel and we have to question why. Why are kids so mean and cruel? Well, they learn it from their parents because kids are not naturally mean and cruel. They're not. They learn it from their parents, and then they take it to the schoolyard. So anybody that was different, uh, you know, if you have red hair, my heart goes out to you because they would chase these kids with red hair all over the place and call them a devil. You're a devil, red devil. Say all this stuff. I mean, like, and just even that, just being born with red hair was enough. So the fact that I'm walking in the door with this supernatural intelligence as a eight-year-old you know, they went right for me, and uh, I didn't really make a lot of friends, except for Patrick Zaremba, wherever you are. He was a little witch, and he knew he was a witch, and his parents, his mother was into the occult, and uh, he said, I'm going to teach you how to curse somebody. That was one of the first things he taught me. He said, uh, you're like me. You're like me. I don't know if that meant gay. I don't really know if he was gay. But he was out of control. And he had wild hair too. Uh, Patrick Zarimba. Green eyes and dirty blonde hair that was never cut. It was all over the place. So Patrick's like, you're like me. I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to show you how to curse somebody. So he was basically saying he was a witch. You know, we're like magic. We we know we're magic. And so me and Patrick were like best buds for a while. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm sitting there after school. And, you know, I mean, as a kid like that, you get used to solitude very quickly. You very, very quickly realize you're alone. You know, now you have TikTok. You can go and see somebody that looks like you. A hundred of them. You know what I mean? You can go and see tarot readings. You can go and see the occult being practiced. You can go see pagans. But, uh, you know, this is 1968. You're trapped and you're alone in Orange County, California. So... I'm sitting there on the swings and this kid comes up that was obviously a gay kid and so there's three sets of swings and I'm on the far left and he comes and he sits in the one in the middle and he asks me like a student to the Buddha he said something like what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? And I was like, time stopped. And all of a sudden, this supernatural intelligence came, and I just started channeling for the kid. So, I mean, I really did my first channeling and meditation, like somewhere around 7, 8, 9, 10. Automatically, uh, I just went into it for the kid, and he was like, thank you, thank you. I don't know. I heard the voice of God the first time when I was around that time as well. Uh, I had a, uh, a dream about having sex or affection or something about a really handsome older guy. And I specifically remember I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I thought, you have to admit to yourself that you're gay. I mean, in the short eight years I'd been alive, I'd had my finger cut off by my cousin. They had to sew it back on. Uh, I had my head split open twice, once by the same cousin, where I lost consciousness in the hospital. I wasn't really in a coma, but uh, I wasn't really in my body. It just kind of was like, we don't know where he is. Uh, I was tied to a hospital bed with a fever of 104 and left for dead. 
That's true. And uh, if that wasn't enough, then some kid that was like probably had 10 years on me would hang out around the grade school. And when the kids would walk home like a stalker, he would like follow people. Craig Campbell, wherever you are. And he was like buffed up. I mean, they gave the kids, the boys, testosterone shots. As if the testosterone in their bodies wasn't enough at 15. They also did this like big pharma CIA experiment on all the boys in Orange County. And they were all jacked up on testosterone. And this kid was probably uh, a psychopath. And he started following me. And I mean, like, I was like four, I wasn't even, I was like five, two at this point. And this kid was like 5'11 or taller and, and beefed up. And so I'm trying to like think, what should I do? I can feel him like on my back following me. And then I f like fall to the ground and I black out. And I remember like uh, I'm, I'm laying on the sidewalk and I looked up at this guy who was also unbelievably handsome football star type. And so it's just so fucked up as a gay kid. It's like the people that are socking you in the face, you're also like, they're so handsome. I, it just was so fucked up. And so... I remember this guy, he, he picked me up off the sidewalk because I think he thought I was dead. And I, I felt the back of my head and I said, what happened? And it was all blood. Now I have my head split open twice. Uh, it's all blood. And he goes, I don't, I threw this thing at you. It was a piece of lead. He either got it from his garage or he just had, I, I think he had it. And it was just a big piece of lead that was really sharp. And he he hit the mark perfectly. He split the back of my head open. And I just looked at him and I ran away. I went home. I don't know how I knew to put peroxide on it. No Google. No cell phone. Uh, but I was like peroxide. And I would dabbing it. And, you know, it was completely throbbing. And then I had a beanie and I put it on, I put the paper on so it would absorb the blood. And uh, I go to the dinner table and my stepmother is like, you look ridiculous, take that hat off. And I'm like, no, I want to wear it. Like I would not tell my family anything that ever happened to me ever. Because they were already bullying me for being gay and... Uh, you know, like, like you really are going to tell the main source of your physical, mental, psychic abuse that you got abused at school as well. They would just say, oh, that, you know, it's your fault. You're being bullied. Like, it, just bizarre. So, uh, what was the point of that story? So, you know, before I was like, 12, I had all this physical trauma, psychic trauma, sexual trauma, uh, and it that kind of trauma, when you think your life is uh, being threatened constantly, and in some cases, it really was. I mean, this kid fucking hit me with a piece of lead. Uh, in today's world, that would be a lawsuit and an assault against that guy and his family. You know what I mean? Like, instant assault charges. But, uh... He drew blood. I should have, like, gone to the hospital. I knew that, like, I'm, there was a chance I might, uh... Have a concussion, a true concussion. And that they tell you, don't go to sleep. Because you're not going to wake up. And I... I remember thinking, like, you know... Uh... I may not wake up. Because I might have a concussion. And... I remember thinking that. Yeah, you know, then I tried to overdose around 12 on cocaine. And, uh, you know, I bought a gram of coke at 12 years old. And, uh, yep, you could. I did. And I snorted it as fast as I could. And I read a book on cocaine that said, 
when you're about to overdose, your heart will slow down and everything will start to shut down. So I did this Coke at my desk in my parents' home 11 o'clock at night when they were asleep and I planned it and I was like writing, you know, poetry and then, yep, I remember my heart beating like that and then, you know, talk about being alone. You know what I mean? Like, you're a 12-year-old. You don't have anybody to talk to. I don't really agree with, like, all this rainbow, gay, trans, like, we have to tell all the preschoolers about the gay pride parade. I don't agree with that. There is, like, plenty of representational, healthy gay people out there at this point. You know what I mean? But, like, in my day, it was like, uh, what are we, 30 minutes? In my day, it was like gay people were either beaten up and killed in the movies or they just didn't exist. Like there is, like I, so the cumulative sum total effect of all this, pressure, uh, you had to know if somebody was coming for you. So you really, your whole f complete psychic self, I remember why I was telling this story. So your whole psychic self uh, is completely five-star opened up, 100%. You're alone. There's nobody to talk to. There's no book to read. There's no video to watch. There's no TikTok people saying it's okay if you're gay or bi. Uh, my stepmother was unbelievably homophobic, and so was my dad. So I knew they hated me. So I have this dream about this guy, you know, and I would have given anything to be like on the wrestling team or, uh, you know, I didn't have anybody to show me how to play basketball. My dad was a workaholic and he was, wasn't around. And uh, there was a couple failed attempts at being like a father, but it just, he was like this hardcore stone cold German and, uh, it just wasn't his scene, you know. My stepmother would try to be like, uh, you know, you have to spend time with each other. And it just didn't work. It was so unbelievably uncomfortable. So, you know, my stepmother's like, uh, our son's a little fag. He's playing with Barbies. And my dad's like, you know, you're a little fairy. Why should I even talk to you? Oh, completely. So that type of isolation uh, started really young and uh, it still continues today. You just like, you're alone. You know, there's a lot of healthy, normal gay guys that are like, they have partners. And, the, the, you know, they have partners and they have kids and they have a marriage and they have dogs. And I don't know, it just got in so deep that uh, the trauma word. But so, to, I'm going to wrap it up. So the point was that uh, I have a dream about this really handsome, cis, ultra-masculine guy. And uh, he said, I in the dream, I remember saying something like, uh, Who are you? And he said, I'm you. I'm you in the future. And I was like, well, okay. And I woke up and it was a wet dream. I woke up and I had a nocturnal emission and I was completely ashamed. I looked in the mirror and I said, you have to admit that you're gay. Like all this pressure and I'm alone, I'm... I'm, you know, I'm physically, psychically, and spiritually, my life's in danger. I'm trying to commit suicide. And uh, I have the pressure of, like, telling myself you have to come out or you have to. And I heard the voice of God instantly. It was an angel. And I'm looking in the mirror, and I hear the voice of the angel. And the vo what I really believe is the voice of God say, listen, Kirk, in this lifetime, you're gay. And I was just like, boy, they just leveled the, they were just like, here it is. 
And it was a sane, loving, clear, clean voice in my ear. You're gay. Your life's going to be really hard. You can't tell anybody you're going to have to become another person until you can get away from your family and until you can get away from everybody and go somewhere to a big city. And I was like, I understood. Yep, I got it. I mean, it was just like taking dictation. It was like a full download in about 30 seconds. And I went, I understand. And uh, I started, you know, that's when I really started drinking, like alcoholically. I, you know, I, kids will find a way. Uh, you know, and so all of this is going on. And, you know, I'm coming home high, so high I can't even talk late at night. My stepmother is just like out of control. What's wrong with you? You know, and the whole thing was uh, in Orange County, California, all the kids were committing suicide. Kenny, this kid Kenny uh, put a gun in his mouth at 13 in his own bedroom. Uh, another kid, Mark, died from uh, an, an accident while they a bunch of them were high. I won't go into the details. There was a lot of weird stuff like that, a lot of dark stuff. And the parents were like, well, we live in upper middle class, upper white suburbia. We don't have any problems. And all the kids are like complete drug addicts. And, the, you know, none of the parents were like, oh, well, I guess, you know, we have a problem. No, at the time it was like, our kids are bad. We got a bad kid. Like that's how the parents would bond with each other in their own fucked up denial. Oh, we got a bad kid. Don't you feel sorry for us? The kids were running away, joining in sex cults. I mean, like really, this was all going on. And uh, the parents would just be like, we got a bad kid. And the and parents would, there was no ownership of anything. You know, it was all the kids' fault. Well, the kids, you know, they're taking drugs. They're out of control. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so there's no, like, uh, the kids just acting like you. You just can't stand to look at it. So, uh, you know, once again, completely and totally alone. Anyway, so that's some of my mediumship. Uh, when I got sober, I met my first teacher, my first real teacher was my best friend's uh, friend, uh, best friend's mom, who was a Christian mystic, and she would sit there and pray in meditation for an hour every day, and she was a medium, but she wouldn't call it that because of the Bible, but she was, and she had angels in her house, and I went over there one time, and she had some shirts on a hanger that she'd been ironing and one of the shirts right in front of me just lifted off and like floated through the air and she said we either have an angel or oh we have a ghost see and she would talk to it out loud so that was when I was 16 so uh I also uh an hypnotist came to my high school uh, on a side note, and hypnotized people and put on this whole show. I don't know. Why did they bring a hypnotist to a high school and put on a show in the, you know, drama club stage? I don't know. But so I saw that very early too. Like, oh, you can, you know, there's another reality. So there's like all these other realities and the guy hypnotized me. He said, you're stuck to your seat. You can't move. And I was like, uh, it went right into my mind. My mind was so open. Anyway, so I don't know. That's a spiritual update. So I'm going to finish the haunting. You know, as it stands now, I live in Hell's Kitchen, which is literally the most haunted part of New York City, the theater district in Hell's Kitchen. And it's, there's ghost tours. I've said it in other video. There's ghost tours because my building is, had a famous murder right below this window. Yep. Famous murder. And so it's on a ghost tour. And in warm weather, I can see like a group of like seven people and the tour guide pointing over to my building. Like, yep, famous murder right there. 
There was another famous murder uh, two blocks from here in Times Square at an Irish pub. They made a film of it. Uh, so, yeah, Haunted Hell's Kitchen. So it only makes sense that a medium would attract the most haunted part of town. So, yeah, you know, uh, being an addict in recovery, I really have seen that uh, addicts, uh, first and foremost, the details and particulars of being an addict, but then after that, like sitting in the back row of recovery rooms for over 30 years, uh, addicts are haunted. Alcoholics are haunted. I know you don't believe me, but they really are haunted. They have ghosts, even if it's the ghost of the past. Uh, their pain and recollection of the phantom of their trauma in the past. And until you energetically release those things and get rid of those things, which also I call our curses, it's a form of being cursed. You have to release those curses and those ghosts up to the universe and say, you know, I don't want to live with this anymore. So that's part of the work that I do with people. Uh, there's also something called the hungry ghost, which you might want to Google because we're going to wrap it up. But uh, in Chinese Buddhism, they believe uh, that the entire planet is haunted as well. And that this life is a life of shadows and darkness and dreams and illusions. And every culture has this like illusion uh, story that they tell people. You know what I mean? So our magic of the day and our Plato's cave is, you know, movies. But so everybody says this is a dream world. We wake up when we leave our bodies that's the real world is on the other side. So I'll just leave you with all that. Uh, I hope you like the shaman hair. Uh, shaman hair is happening. I got the shaman hair from two people. Uh, if you look at Einstein, who's an absolute genius, he has the same hair. Einstein has shaman hair. And so also Don King, the boxing promoter, also has the shaman hair. Stick it straight up. And I saw Don King's hair and I was like, that is the coolest freaking shit I've ever seen. I love that. I want my hair to be just like Don King's hair. I mean, sticking straight up. So, uh, yeah, shaman hair. Um, I don't know. What's the big finish? Uh, thank you for letting me be your sacred healer and listening to me and watching my vids. If you want any topics discussed, uh, just put them in the comments. Comments, please subscribe if you want to. Uh, the people that are supposed to hear me will hear me. And uh, yeah, I mean, I represent the world that I understand the world is haunted. People are haunted, uh, you know. The most haunted cities, London, Paris, uh, Los Angeles, haunted and cursed. And uh, New York is unbelievably haunted as well. So, and I live in the most haunted part of the, all of New York City. So yes, uh, befitting for a natural born psychic medium. So all this stuff that happened, it opened up all my psychic channels. They ne never shut off. It's a complete PTSD. So, you know, they say there's like a gift in the trauma. The trauma is not a gift in and of itself, but the byproduct of the trauma actually is a gift. And so now they're starting to say, you know, I'm a trauma therapist. I'm certified in three different types, four different types of trauma recovery for PTSD as a, a certified uh, hypnotherapist. So, uh... The, the trauma creates a byproduct, and that's the gift. It's either like you are an empath, you're highly sensitive, clairvoyance, clairaudio, clairsentient, claircognizant. You just know stuff. And I just have all of them. I, you know, it's a miracle I'm alive and that I didn't die. And, you know, so you're always fighting. When I was a gay kid, 
uh, you're fighting to negotiate your existence and apologizing for it along the way. Yep, and then as a psychic, you know, I was terrified to tell people what I was. It's only now that when I saw this off-the-chain TikTok shit that I'm like, okay, I guess it's anything goes, so nobody's going to really raise an eyebrow for me to talk about my stuff. I mean, they're talking about shit on TikTok I wouldn't repeat ever. I just watch it sometimes at night, and I'm like, I don't believe my eyes so they are you know they're the baseline to free me to be like yes I'm a natural born psychic medium here's what happened and uh I mean I think if after all those things the gift of the trauma is I became a five star seven star psychic like I literally I'm also certified in, in face reading Which isn't a complete art in and of itself. Uh, Thank you, Alexa. So, uh, because you thought your life was in danger and, you know, your parents... Thank you, Alexa. Sorry. Um, Alexa says, have an awesome day to me every day. So, uh... You know, my parents were uh, trauma survivors as well. And my dad was probably an empath, I think. And he covered it, like, really well. He covered it by, with rage. And, you know, they could just come at you with this rage at any time. Like, you turn around, kabam. So there was a lot of uh, physical... You know, they would grab your clothes like you better, you know. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. And so you just never know. So you were always knocked out of your body. The minute you tried to get into your body, knocked out, knocked out, knocked out again. Here comes a fist. Uh, you know, your head split open. I mean, you know, now they're saying, like, if you get a concussion and you get your head split open, uh, it's permanent damage. And so I really think, like... God and those angels and those voices I heard. I mean, uh, so I do that for clients now, but uh, I channel for clients. That's what I do, what I get. And uh, But I can read somebody's face. The gift of the trauma is I can literally look at somebody's face and subconsciously know what they're thinking. I can read their thoughts completely. And so it's like a combination of psychic channels opening up from the trauma. And then, thank God, I made it this far and got sober. But, you know, most people would end up drug zombies or in a psych ward or never get sober or they just die. I mean, they just kind of like wake up one day and I was like, boy, this is way... I I think... uh, I think I knew it was going to be a fucked up, bumpy ride. So I had a really bad, very hard start. And, you know, I mean, I could just say I'm proud of myself. You should look in the mirror once a day and go, I'm proud of you. Uh, But, you know, the fact that, and even as a gay guy, I mean, I, I, I don't really know if I identify as gay like in rainbow flag thing I, I I don't know on that one so in today's world I would never look I got one white in today's world my gray is showing uh, in today's world I don't think I would come out and it would be none of anybody's fucking business and you know at work I would just be like if I was in a workplace I would be like you know uh, I need this person off my back. I'm going to fucking see you. And they'll be like, yeah, you can't interrogate people like in the 80s when I was in the restaurant business. You know, yeah, it was constant, unending attack. More attack. More attack. Here comes the attack. This place is a, is a place of attack. I mean, everything needs to be protected. Like, just 
lift your head up for a minute and, and, and get a perspective in the simulation that like, why does every single thing need to be protected? Can we, uh, you know, is it possible to create a world where we don't have to be like under attack constantly? It, you know, you have to wonder, like, it, you know, it makes your immune system and your uh, adrenalized system be like on fire constantly, on high alert. And for some reason, that keeps you in a state of survival. But if you really meditate through it, then you get that gift of ultra supernatural awareness in a healthy way. Mind your surroundings. That's Bruce Lee. So anyways, okay, Shakti and Namaste. Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with my button down. Thank you for putting up with me waking up. And uh, so that's your spiritual update uh, for April, the first week. So, okay. Thanks for listening. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, there's 300 hours of videos professionally produced or just on the fly. So I'm Kirk Kerber. It's been my honor to heal you. I am not reading. I'm not giving out life readings. I took that offline on my website. I'm not doing it right now. I'm exhausted. So until further notice, my life reading, soul arc readings are offline. Not going to happen until I like get replenished. Okay, Shakti, happy Easter coming up soon. Uh, and I think if I'm not mistaken, isn't like Easter and Passover. I'm, I'm like that much Jewish. Uh, Easter and Passover are like kind of the same time. Anyways... Uh, spring equinox. Yep. It's all going on. Shakti Namaste. There's some gate opening up April 12th uh, that deals with Jupiter and good luck. Just saying, bros. Okay, I will see you next time in the Cyber Temple of Love. Remember, it's not about power. It's about grace. Shakti Namaste.